city of Peterborough. Go ahead. City of Peterborough, the um, Ontario Arts Council, uh, the DBIA, Community Foundation of Greater Peterborough, the Peterborough Foundation, um, and Canadian Heritage. Those are all funders who help EC3 um, operate and do programming all year long. And I'd like to do our land acknowledgements. Um, we want to respectfully acknowledge that the land on which we gather tonight is Treaty 20 Mississauga Territory, and it's in the traditional ter territory of the Mississauga and Chippewa nations. It's home to the Williams Treaties First Nations. EC3 recognizes that the Williams Treaties First Nations have been the stewards and caretakers of these lands from time immemorial for countless generations, and they continue this work today. We're grateful, very grateful to be here and to have the opportunity to learn more about their knowledge and traditions and ways of being in this world. We commit EC3 to supporting their work and doing all we can to further efforts at real truth and reconciliation, which for us as an arts council includes providing support to indigenous artists and create, creating space for their voices and their work to be seen, heard and respected. We know that um, we're a long way from achieving the recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation um, Commission's report and a long way from the justice that Indigenous people deserve. I wanted also just to give you a little bit of background on this workshop periodically over the last, particularly the last two years during, during COVID when there have been special programs of support for um, everybody in the arts and sometimes particularly for artists, um, doing your annual income taxes has become more and more challenging, more and more questions people had. And so we reached out to other arts councils um, across the province to see um, how they had been handling this. And Tova's company or the company she works with, Art Books, have been doing quite a few workshops like this and came highly recommended. So we're thrilled to have Tova here and I'll ask her to introduce herself a little bit. Um, we're gonna be, um, have a presentation about a one hour presentation from Tova and then we'll have half an hour for questions and answers. I think that's all from me, Tova, if you want to take it away, but if you could introduce yourself, we're delighted to have you here and uh, are looking forward to your presentation. Well, thanks for having me, Sue and Gabe. I'm really happy to be virtually in Peterborough because I don't think I've ever actually been to Peterborough. Mm -hmm. So I have to rectify that. I will get out there one day. I've got friends mm -hmm. there. Um, my cat would also like to be in Peterborough, apparently. He's climbing on me. Anyway, thanks so much for having me and thanks for coming. Everybody know the weather is pretty crappy. So why why wouldn't you want to talk about tax on a really crappy night? I'm going to share my screen and get a little PowerPoint started and then we can talk. I'll talk a little bit about myself and um, and then a lot about tax because that's that's what we're here for. Now I just have to remember how to use PowerPoint. Here we go. All right. So um, a little bit about me, uh, as Sue said, I'm, I'm a, I work for a place called Art Books. Um, I'm also an actor and I work with uh, wildlife. I work in a, in a wildlife rehab center called the Toronto Wildlife Center. So um, this, is, this is me as an actor and me as a, as a, as a pigeon lover. That's what I do when I'm not doing taxes. And uh, I work at a place called Art Books, which has been around for about 35 years. And it's a arts focused tax firm. There are a handful in Toronto, and I'm going to speak fairly Toronto specific because I don't know the surrounding areas as well in terms of uh, tax offerings. But certainly with COVID, everyone's doing remote taxes now, so you can you can do taxes wherever you want. Um, but this is a little our books. If you remember, about 35 years, we try to present as a pretty friendly place because taxes are very scary uh, for everybody, myself included. I find taxes pretty stressful. And, and I do them for a living. Um, and so what I'm hoping to do tonight is sort of demystify a little bit of the, the myth around the Canada Revenue Agency, which is the place that manages our taxes. And, uh, and hopefully encourage you to have a stronger relationship with them. 
So that being said, um, actually I'm gonna back up a little bit. I think it's helpful to understand the context of, of tax in terms of like how I came to tax, because I am an actor. When I uh, got out of theater school and I was working in theaters, I had a, a boss who wanted me to help her with her receipts. And I was pretty interested in about receipts because it seemed like she was doing it to save money somehow in the myth of tax. And so I would help her with her receipts. And then one day she said, you should go to my accountant. And I thought, oh, I don't, you know, I'd up until I was 24, probably I had, had kept like three or four receipts for things that someone had told me, you know, in a whisper, you can save these for your taxes. And I would give them to my mom and she would give the receipts off to her mystery accountant. And then a month later, I'd get some paperwork that didn't make sense. And I'd be told what I owed and it was all, uh, completely unexplained and a mystery and I didn't feel comfortable with it because it's my money I should know what's happening to it so then I was working for this lovely lady named Mary and she said you should go to art books and so I went to art books and had a meeting with Amanda who's the owner of the company and um, it just changed everything for me because for most artists we get into art to make art <laughs> all of us do um, and we really don't want to know about the numbers and then we don't want to know about the math part and pretty early on in my relationship with our books I was lured into working for them and I was like no nope, no nope, I'm an actor I don't I don't do numbers high school math dropout like I literally dropped out of math in grade 12 and I never looked back and, um, and then I moved to LA and I came back dead broke and they're like now do you want to work for us and I said yeah I should work for you. And that was um, in 2009. So I guess that's 14 years. Um, and what I, what I think I learned and what I appreciate the most about doing tax for artists and for and, and being a client for so long is it, the sense of empowerment I get in knowing my business. Um, my business as an actor is generally a kind of a failing business. Acting is pretty tough. I do not make a profit most likely from my acting because it's an expensive business to run. Um, but I understand how I can run my business in a way that doesn't raise flags and it feels true and reasonable to me. And I love imparting that information to other artists because they don't wanna know usually, but it's a really good thing to know your business and, and be able to defend your business if anybody asks and just have a, a strong sense of empowerment around your business. And the government. So I'm going to be calling the CRA the CRA. As we know, that's the Canada Revenue Agency. Um, the very first question I always ask is, when are your taxes due? Because it seems like no one knows. People get confused because the states, the American deadline is April 15th and ours is April 30th. And there's a lot of confusion about which is which, but Canadian taxes are due April 30th. However, if you have a, a freelance business or you're a small sole proprietor or you're a non-incorporated business, or you're the partner of somebody, um, marital partner, not business partner, marital, marital partner of somebody who has a small business as a freelancer, that kind of thing as a consultant, you can also file until June 15th. So anybody with a small business that's not incorporated can file, they have an extra six weeks to do the prep because as we all know, adding up the receipts takes some time. We get more time to prepare our numbers so that we can file our taxes until June 15th. So often there's a mis misconception about, well, I'm, I, I don't have a freelance business, but my, my partner does. It's as long as you're filing with your partner in a relationship of some kind of filing and saying, I'm in a relationship with this person, you have until June 15th as well. However, the trick is paying. The deadline to pay is April 30th. And it doesn't matter when you file. So uh, the biggest confusion people come to, and the CRA doesn't really make it super easy, is they want you to pay before you have to file. If we're going to go with the assumption that we're all filing for June 15th because we're freelancers or artists, um, how do we pay before we file? How do we know? And the easiest answer is just to guess. Uh, we are, the government can can kind of penalize us. They can they can get money from us in two different ways. But one is uh, late payment, and one is late filing, and they're different. So late late filing is up starts at about five percent penalties. That they can change it, but it can go up every year you're late. So if you're late one year, they'll probably be like, well, here's five percent penalty on on what you owe. 
And then if you're late two more years in a row, they might bump it up to 7% penalties on what you owe. And if you're late another year, I've seen it go as high as 17% for penalties. Filing late penalties are really, really punitive, and they will hit you with them as much as they can to try to get you to stop filing late. Whereas interest is interest, it's gonna be 5%. I mean, it does, interest will change and they can change it quarterly. I've seen it go down as low as like 1%. I think it's five now, I haven't checked the interest rates right now, but it, it's going to be the interest rate. It's not gonna change when you're late uh, filing. The interest rate is interest rate, we're all paying with an interest rate. So uh, to avoid paying the government unnecessarily extra things, file on time and pay on time. So you can't pay on, you don't know what to owe, you're gonna make a guess. You can look at your taxes from the prior year, and if your income and expenses are kind of the same, sending the government what you kind of owed the year before and an estimate. Mm -hmm. There's yeah, some talk. Sorry, with me in 10 years. <laughs> so, uh, I'm not thinking. Um, I'm just in a webinar. Okay. Maybe everybody can mute themselves. I, I'm not sure. It might just be a little bit easier. Um, yeah, folks, can you please mute? We're hearing uh, background noise. Thanks. thanks. Cool. Uh, so uh, what you want to do is send them a guess. And if you overpay, they will refund you the extra payments. And if you've underpaid, you're only going to be charged interest on the portion that you underpaid. So if you guess, well, I owed five grand this year. I, last year, I'll give them five grand this year. Then you owe five thousand and fifty dollars you'd only pay interest on the $50. So ways to manage your money with the government so that you're not giving them extra are to file on time and pay on time. And if you file on time, knowing that you can't pay on time, you're still saving yourself the penalties from late filing, which are the more punitive ones. So there are like two things I'm gonna hammer home repeatedly in this, in this session. And one of them is file on time. Uh, it really breaks my heart when people come in who haven't done their taxes in a number of years and their taxes are pretty straightforward and their tax bills aren't crazy, but then they get their notices of assessment, which is what the government sends when you file your taxes. And the notice of assessment says, yeah, we agree with all the math, but your penalties are 20% because you haven't filed in five years. And that's the part that can really get you behind the eight ball with the, with the government. So you, the, the just, I will repeat again and again, file on time. It doesn't matter if you can't pay at the same time. You are cutting half of the penalties right out by filing on time. And with, with paying on time, if you can't, because gosh knows it's been really complicated the last couple of years, um, what I tend to tell people who file, like they're filing April 25th and you find, find out that they have the surprise tax bill, I say, you know, we're, we're going to file. You wait five days, you call the government and say, oh, I, you've got my taxes now, it's been a couple of days, you see that I owe you $2,000, I can afford to pay you 200 bucks a month, and they'll work with you. The One of the biggest ways to have a good relationship with the government is to be proactive. There seems to be, and I don't, I can't confirm this, but there seems to be a certain amount of training that goes on at the CRA that says that when people avoid the government, they're guilty of something, we don't know what as opposed to they're avoiding because they're afraid or they're broke or life happened. And so instead of, and, and so you can be afraid and, and life can happen, but calling the government and getting on top of things with them on time can save you hundreds if not thousands of dollars and also put you on a, on a better foot with them. So you wait five days, you give them a call, you say, hey, I owe two grand, I don't have it. Can I give you 200 bucks a month? They'll work with you. Sometimes they'll go as far as to do a means test where they'll, they'll wanna see proof of your revenue and get a sense of your monthly breakdown and uh, monthly expenses and make a plan based on what you have, the cushion. Sometimes they'll do that, but as long it, it, it's they will be much more forgiving if you are proactive and call them. Don't make them come after you. Don't wait for the mail to pile up with the government. If you're not getting electronic mail yet, you're getting those brown envelopes from them. They send a chill into my heart when I see them, the brown government envelopes, because who knows what they want. Answer them, open the letters right away. I, I, calling them and saying, I got a letter and I don't understand it is, is like the best thing you can do because then they're like, okay, they're not avoiding me. Let's explain this letter. I had a client who going through a horrible time a uh, wife with aggressive breast cancer, a daughter with um, an eating disorder. He got a call from the 
HST department with some angry, scary stuff. And he called me instead of calling the government and said, I don't know what to do. My life is falling apart and I can't deal with it. And I said, you have to call them and just tell them, tell them exactly what you just told me. And I got a text about a half an hour later saying, you're right. I called them. I told them what was going on. Everything is fine. Um, we pay a lot of tax in Canada. And part of that tax goes to paying a phone bank, a couple of phone banks, tax, HST, there's phone banks of people there to help us. You may as well use your tax dollars by using the, by calling them. And uh, the CRA is still pretty old school in that way. You can't email them, but you can call. Um, they do pile on more staff around the end of tax season because they know it's gonna be harder to get through. And there are days where it's impossible to get through. But if you can get ahead of things and call them now, if you have a question, or if you can wait until June, getting through, a lot of times the people that you're going to speak to are going to be quite kind. There's even in the state department where the people seem to be extra kind. So if you have a loss in the family, you need to figure out estate planning, taxes around, around uh, uh, somebody who's passed away, there's an estate department you can request through the main number. And they're lovely and they send you great information. So all that to say, Communicating with the CRA is really important. It it's it's going to make your life easier if you are if you can get over your fear of, of of hiding from them. I had a client once who paid me for an hour of my time to go and literally sit beside him and hold his hand, actually hold his hand while he called to talk about HST with the government. And it's fine, you know. I went and I sat and I held his hand, and he put the phone on speaker and talked to the the government. And now he's fine. Like he, we had to just break through, to do it. He needed help, and we did it. If that's what you need to do, that's what you need to do. But at the end of the day, most of the time, you can block your number and call anonymously. Like they don't have to know it's you. You don't have to tell them your personal life. You can tell them hypotheticals. I ask hypotheticals all the time because it's just easier than getting into the whole. Who are you and what do you want? Hypotheticals, they will answer a hypothetical question. So communicating with the CRA, super, super important. Now that we have the sense of, of, of the phone, we also have my account and my business account. A lot of people got, and got a hooked up with my account during the pandemic because you could administer your CRB benefits there. Some people did that through Service Canada, but if you did it, if you did it, if you didn't do it through my account, it's worth getting a my account now because my account is a bank of all the information you might need. Uh, prior RSPs and T4s, your um, all your communication from the CRA can be there electronically instead of through paper. You can administer your HST through your my account, through my business account. If you haven't got a my account set up, I strongly encourage you to do so. It takes about two weeks if you go the old school way because they will paper mail you a password because again the CRA is about 20 years behind on a lot of things they still like to get faxes so just be aware that when you want to get a my account it's not an immediate thing you can log in through your bank which is easier um I don't bank with a bank that I could log in through so they had to mail me a password it's fine I have my my account don't lose the password I lost my password it was another month my account is great when you're in my account, this is the dashboard. They've just renovated it. Can you renovate a website? They've just redesigned the website so it looks a little bit more like this. Um, and key things to know about here in your dashboard are, you can see just on the bottom left-hand corner, there's a, it says one mail. You wanna make sure you're checking your mail pretty regularly. You're gonna get your notices of assessment. You might get the review, processing review letters. Processing review letters specifically with artists, they come frequently if you're a recipient of grants, people get processing review letters. Uh, we get a lot of panicky emails usually in September and December. It's when they go out saying that they're being audited and that what they've had is they've gotten a processing review letter. And so the Canada, Canadian tax system is one of self-assessment. We do our taxes, we think this is what I owe, we tell the government this is what I think, and then once the dust is settled in April and they've had time to quickly review taxes, they'll they'll go back and do a second pass of some of some tax returns. It's called a processing review, where they say, you know, you've said what you you said your piece now, we're going to say our piece. And we'll talk a bit more about grants in a, in a little bit. But if you are a recipient of grants, you probably will get a letter asking for more information about it. And so you want to make sure you're checking your mail and your my account. Uh, when you get a letter, they want you to submit your documents. And up until about two years ago, fax was kind of their preferred method of getting 
documents, but now with submit my documents here, really great way to upload information, especially when you have to do multiple pages. In the fall of 2020, I had to fax something for a client and trying to find any kind of a Kinko's or FedEx that was open that would fax for me, like in September of 2020 was really hard. <laughs> so submit my docs is great. What I cut out of this um, screen capture, which is a bummer because this is important, for people who haven't heard the trick, there is a, a, a block in the middle. So we've got the tax returns block and then there's a, the accounts and payments block. And a couple blocks down is one called uncashed checks. And for those of you that haven't been taught the trick of the uncashed check uh, as residents of Canada and also for people in Ontario, there are a variety of credits that we're entitled to. The provincially, there's a credit called the trillion benefit, which is lower income. People who are paying rent or property tax can sometimes qualify for a monthly small, like $30 bump, little, little bit of a credit there. Those come on in check form if you haven't signed up for direct deposit. Uh, and then federally, we have GST credits, which are quarterly credits, again, for lower income families and individuals, GST credits. The government checks never stale date. They don't, they don't expire. You can cash a government check 20 years later. They should cash it. And if you haven't cashed them, they've now put them online. So in your inside your My Account, a little further down in this in this screen view, uncashed checks, do yourself a favor and have a look there. You might find a couple hundred bucks, you might find 30 bucks. Either way, if they're there, you can cash them and you can come into a little bit of money that's legitimately yours why not do it so my account chock full of amazing things the other thing that it's going to have is you can see on the right hand side it says tax information slips so how you know people get t4s if you have a day job so like you're a server your, your restaurant gives you a t4 um you apply for a grant and the canada council sends you a t4a for the grant you have some bank interest that comes on a t5 you invest some money in an rsp that rsp slips Whenever anybody issues you a slip, they have to also issue the government a copy of the same slip so that the government, when you're filing your taxes, is putting together the jigsaw puzzle of, of you. So you're saying, I have the slip, and they're saying, I have the slip, and they match, hooray, the, your tax return should be right. Um, those slips are now uploaded to this portal. They will not be uploaded right away. T4s are not required to be filed until the end of February. So if you're looking for a T4 now, it's probably not going to be there. You're going to want to wait till like the first week of March. Sometimes they come out earlier. I've already got one T4, but uh, typically people are going to drag their heels a little bit. It'll take a little while. And with RRSPs, because we have a different calendar year, for, it's not really the right term, but our, our contribution period for RSP starts March 1st and ends February 28th of the following year. So we usually will get a, two or more RRSP contribution slips. One, I just got one today, my first one today, which will be for March through December. And then in the March, in a month and a half, I'll get some more for the Jan Feb of 2023, which I would use against the prior year's taxes. So those slips right now, if you're looking at tax information slips for 2022, going to be probably pretty empty. You're going to want to wait a little while as well. Sometimes, certainly with arts organizations that are smaller, they, they fail to send the government copies of the slips. So you might have a copy of a slip that's not in the government's portal. And it doesn't mean that your slip is, is bogus just because it's not on the government portal. It means that your, your engager was slow to get their slips into the government or didn't do it right. I mean, there's a lot of, of bookkeeping errors out there. So when you're preparing to do your taxes, typically I encourage people to review what's in hand, what's their actual paper documents compared to the CRA's version. There might be some that are in one place and not the other, but you've got to report all of them, whatever one is. You're not going to report duplicates, but you'll report every original T-slip because that's our job. You, If you are doing a fair amount of investing, mutual funds and TF and mutual, not TFSA, but mutual funds and stocks, stuff like that. Those slips, the T3s aren't required to be issued until the end of March, which can really put a damper on trying to file early, which is tough because you'll get those slips in the middle of, in the middle of April when all of the accountants are like, we're too busy, go away. Unfortunately, that's just the way it is, but just bear in mind that slips kind of trickle in and they can trickle in for, for months, which is pretty frustrating. But my account, really, really handy. A lot of information here, prior tax returns, 
prior notices of assessment. If you're trying to get a mortgage, you're going to need your notice of assessment. It's going to be here if you filed on time. Uh, you can pay taxes this way. You can pay your HST through my business account. You can see how much your, your limit is for RSP contributions and TFSAs. Th this is if really, really, if you haven't got your money account set up, sign up, sign up for my account. It's, it's pretty great. All right, how taxes work, our primer, quick glass of water. Okay. The main thing that people get confused about, I think, especially when they're new to art, is they they approach us and say, well, I have to do my, my business taxes because I have a business now. And we say, yep, that's the same as your personal taxes. And they say, no, but I have a business. And I say, yeah, it's, just, it's fine. It's your business. Your business is part of your personal until or unless you ever incorporate as a small business, we are, our business is just part of our normal tax return, which is, which is called a T1. So a T1 is what everybody in Canada files. And when we have a small business or an art practice, we would add, there's one form we would fill in within the T1. It's called the T2125, your statement of business income. Essentially what it is, it's a profit and loss statement. So what I made, what I spent, the difference is what I get taxed on. How taxes work is the first chunk of the of the tax, it's called the jacket. The first chunk of the jacket is all your income. So line one is gonna be everything I made from T4 jobs. So for me, I'm a server, well, I'm not a server, I'm gonna use the example. So me as a server, I made 10 grand from being a waitress. And then the next line would be tips because tips are taxable. And just gonna be lines of income, investment income, rental income, money out of my RSP income, and then the net, from my business. So we pay tax on the net from our from our business income. And then that's all gets that all gets added up. It's my gross income. And then there's a chunk. The next chunk is expenses or or deductions like RSPs and childcare and that kind of stuff. Income, gross income, expenses, net income, taxable income. I pay tax on on the bottom line. So what we're looking for is trying to reduce that extra little bit of income that we're adding. So if we have a day job and investment income and rental income, the our business income can really change how our tax bill goes. Because if we were to dump in all of our gross, say we got like 50 grand in grants and we had to pay tax on the 50 grand it would, and adding it on to another T4 would be quite considerable. So we wanna make sure that we're being pretty careful about it, determining our net, which we're gonna talk about maybe on the next slide. Yeah, I'll talk about income first. Okay, there we go. So taxable income has gotten more confusing with the gig economy and with life online. And so basically taxable income is pretty much anything you do uh, other than like, you know, birthday, birthday money from your family and that kind of stuff. So employment income, grants are taxable, cash payments are taxable. People love to say, well, cash it didn't count but um hairdressers get tips it's taxable and servers get tips and it's taxable and cab drivers get tips and that's taxable um babysitting the the cra is sort of snuck in a bit of an insidious little place in in the area where you would be claiming child care child care is a great deduction for families but when you want to claim babysitting as opposed to daycare or something babysitting they actually want you to report the name of the babysitter and their sin number because theoretically they could then go back and check the sin number the check the babysitters and make sure the babysitters are claiming the income which seems pretty gross when babysitters are like 14 but that's what they do so babysitting is taxable income lawn mowing all that kind of cash stuff investment income crypto is when you're when you're selling crypto and there's a gain it's taxable and Crypto is kind of the wild, wild west, and I don't know a ton about it. I just know that oftentimes you have to track your own gains and losses with, with stuff that's not through registered accounts. So you really have to be careful about your Bitcoins and stuff. Keep track of your, your investment income. For your, if you're going to go through like a wealth simple or a quest trade, you're going to likely get a slipper or a report of some kind. But if you're doing your own stuff, make sure you're keeping track of your crypto stuff. Patreon, if you set up a Patreon to support your art, Patreon subscriptions are, are taxable. Online ad sales, if you have sponsorships through you do, you know, YouTube videos or whatever, it's mm. taxable. <laughs> all of those, all of those little things where we can make an extra 50 bucks a month just to support our art, it's taxable. And oftentimes, if you're getting it through like a stripe or a square 
or Shopify, they're going to provide you with decent reports about what your income is. And the trick there is that typically people will report what they got as opposed to what they, like what they actually got in their bank as opposed to what they made, which is different. So I usually use the example of I, I'm making t-shirts and I'm selling them through Etsy and the sale price is 25 bucks. And what I get in my bank is 20 bucks because Etsy took $5 to whatever their Etsy fee was is five bucks. The correct way of reporting that would be I made 25 bucks, that's my gross, and I paid five bucks to Etsy. So I'm paying tax on 20, which is what I got, but I'm showing that I made 25 because I did. I sold a shirt, 25. I paid Etsy this to, to help me make that sale. So I pay them. That's an expense I could write off. So that's an expense, Tova? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. We're going to talk about expenses in the next okay. slide. That's, so that's the expense. So uh, all of those bigger websites, Shopify, they all have reports where they're going to show your sale, your, your, your fees for sale, for selling, and then the net. And you want to try to be careful to claim your income, the full income, and then, and then pay somebody or something to help you make that money. Oftentimes we get artists who are not sure if they have a business and they feel insecure about it. It hasn't been doing very well. And the government's idea behind like, what's a business is that you can demonstrate a reasonable expectation of profit a reasonable expectation of profit. So a lot of businesses don't make money. As I said, my, my acting doesn't really make a profit, um, but I can demonstrate that I have expectation of profit because the expenses that I claim indicate that I have a professional business whereby I pay an agent to help me get work. If I sold t-shirts, paying Shopify or Etsy to help me sell those shirts, those expenses are really nice, legitimate ways of showing like, no, no, I wanna make money. I'm paying, <laughs> I'm paying people to help me make money. So when we're looking at our business, knowing that we are claiming expenses that legitimize us, like paying to sell product is a really, really great way to legitimize the business, especially when the business, if the business is having an off year and the income is kind of low, one of your best expenses is gonna be, look, I paid a fee to sell a good. I paid my agent, I paid my booking manager, I paid people to help me make the money that I made. So we'll talk about grants and we'll get into expenses. Grants can be, tricky because people often have the misconception that they're not taxable. But I think that that comes from the idea that when you're writing a grant, typically you're presenting a budget and the budget should show that the grant is all spent because grants are part about making profit. Uh, they are uh, about having the money to pursue your art form. And so they are taxable, but ideally if, you're, if you've allocated the budget so that it's all being spent on subcontractors and supplies and stuff like that. You're not really paying tax on it. Most people will work into their budget that they get an artist fee. And that's the portion you'd be paying tax on. So there, there usually is a bit of hopefully some fees that you're keeping for yourself in order to make the art. And that's the portion that would be taxable. Now, the biggest issue with grants, and probably some of you have dealt with this, and if you haven't, you will you get grants. It's, it's the most common and challenging part of any art form where grants are part of the equation is that specifically, well, I shouldn't say specifically Canada Council. Um, the Canada Revenue Agency has mandated where information goes on the T-slips that we get. So when we get a T4 from our day job and there's a, a box, uh, 14, which is our income and, and 16, which is our CPP and 18 is our EI or those are the boxes that the CRA said, these, these boxes mean X. And so for T4As, specifically from Canada Council, they have said, your grant money goes into this box called box 105. This is all gonna be Greek to you and that's okay. But box 105 is a real catch-all for a bunch of random income. Specifically, it's predominantly scholarship income from schools. And so when they mix scholarship income from schools and with grants, it sets, a, sets off a, some confusion on the government level because scholarships are non-taxable if you're in school full-time. So the same box number that has got tax exempt income can also have grants which are not tax exempt. And so when we think about the, the sort of the larger population of Canada, probably more T4As are going out for scholarships for students than there are for the small community of grant recipients. So when we file our taxes and we show our grant on our business, 
we're not showing it where the government expects it to be, which is scholarship income. And so the government gets confused and sends that letter saying, hey, you got this T slip that says scholarship on it and where's your scholarship? And then you have to say, oh, no, 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 it's a grant and it's with my business and then it's fine. But that's where I was talking about earlier about the processing review letters. When you get a grant, if you're handling the grant correctly with tax, it'll go on your business statement because it's part of your business and then the government won't be able to find it. And there's nothing much that we can do <laughs> because it's the government's rules and we follow them. And then it creates all this busy work for us that in the fall and panic for artists when they get these letters. But that's just the nature of the beast right now until the CRA can make it better. I've I've had a meeting with the head of finance at Canada Council a couple of years ago and she's like, yeah, yeah, we know about this problem. It's a horrible problem. There's nothing we can do. <laughs> we talk to the CRA about it all the time. And, you know, they don't, they're not, moving the CRA is like trying to turn a boat away from the iceberg. Uh, it takes a while, you gotta have advanced, it, it takes a while to turn that thing. So um, this is basically your heads up. If you get a grant, it can be a bit tricky with your taxes. Also, you really wanna be able to, if possible, work with an accountant who understands grants because, because the slip will come with money in a weird box. It could end up that your grant money ends up tied up in a weird part of your tax return, which isn't tied to your business. And we wanna to try to keep our grant money tied to our business because we wanna show the in and the out of the income from the grant and the expense of the grant. And if we were to, <laughs> if we were to follow the, the box number on the slip, your income will end up on a random line in the tax return and your expenses will be in a different line and they won't line up and they make a weird looking business. So I encourage you if you are doing taxes and you have grants to speak to an arts related accountant or you know you can call the CRA but you want to tread lightly about how grants are handled and try to make sure that you that you get it to live on your T2125 which is your business statement. And there've mm -hmm. definitely been tweaks to tax filing softwares to make it easier to do so in the last couple of years. All that to say, if you get grants, you're probably gonna get a letter. Don't be afraid. It doesn't mean you're being audited. It just means the CRA wants to know where your, where your grant is. And I gotta do is show them, here's my grant. And then I claimed it and then they'll be fine with it. So grants are tricky, but they're still worth applying for because they're pretty easy to fix. The biggest question most people have really is write-offs. What is a write-off? What are my expenses? How does my business work? This is a really, really generic template of an income statement, which is the same as the, what we call the T2125, which is that business form and our taxes. And all it does is shows all of our income, all of our business expenses, I pay tax on the difference. So in this particular example, this is, I think, a photographer, you know, quite a photographer here, an art, a visual artist of some kind. So the, these are generic categories. They're not applicable to everybody, but this is just a sense of like potential expenses uh, and income. But basically the expenses are gonna be, we're gonna go back to that, that reasonable expectation of profit. We wanna show a business that has expectation of profit and we wanna highlight expenses that are reasonable to my business. So for a visual artists, that's gonna be, art supplies and paint and stuff like that. And probably some, some transportation, some maybe some truck rentals to move some supplies, that kind of stuff. For musicians, it's gonna be um, uh, guitar strings and drumsticks and recording equipment and sheet music. And um, back in the day, it was, you know, making, making uh, DVD videos. No, oh, DVDs, gosh, how old am I? Um, CDs. Uh, it's making CDs, all of these things that are reasonable to the business. I, it, we don't have enough time in this session to go through every single art form and every single potential expense. How I try to coach my clients to approach their expenses are, you gotta trust your gut. Does it feel like a business expense? And you've got to apply it for the filter of, of what's reasonable. And that ties into my expectation of earning a profit. If and this is really common if um, most of my expenses are eating out because everybody eats out a lot and they're like, it's all business. Um, that it could be that that's reasonable, but I've seen a number of clients have come in who've made, you know, like two grand a year 
but their eating out expenses are four thousand dollars they may still be all 100 percent legit eating out expenses at our business but it's not reasonable to make two thousand dollars and spend four thousand eating out and then still tack on your art supplies and your transportation stuff like that and have a business that makes no money it's not reasonable what would be reasonable if i'm only making two grand is to really try to focus on the expenses that make my business look super legit like paying my gallery and my art supplies and taking a portion of the meals so when i'm doing a workshop in person i usually have like a dry erase board and i get people to spitball what do you think expenses are and and without fail the top three are usually rent meals and dentist dentist gets thrown in there far often more often than we think and i get it because dentist is not part of the medical stuff that's covered by ohip but dentist is a personal expense it's not a business expense it's a it's an expense you can claim for your medical expenses which is a different part of the tax return it's a personal expense and we can claim medical expenses not on our business statement in the tax in the medical receipts portion and just so people remember medical expenses this is a sidetrack where people get confused or they don't realize dental is a medical expense and optical and massage and chiropractor and naturopathy and a variety of things and if you don't know if it's a medical expense if you literally google cra and medical you get a whole page just page with like alphabetically what's a medical expense who's a doctor that's allowed really really handy so if you don't know if a medical expense is allowed therapy, psychotherapy, social work, all those things, birth control pills, all that stuff, medical expenses, Google it. For the sake of this argument to discussion, we're talking about business expenses for our, for our freelance business and the biggest misconceptions or the biggest sort of anxiety around it is people's writing off parts of their home. And that's where we're gonna use that word reasonable again, because what's reasonable to claim is typically less than what the government less than what you think is reasonable uh, is reasonable when you're dealing with stuff that has an inherent like biological imperative to it like food and housing you can't be you can't claim a lot of it basically um had a client who was a sculptor he insisted that his workshop where he lived was 90 percent office 10 percent personal and of course he got audited and it was horrible and and that was the end of he stopped running a business because the audit was so horrible um, your home may indeed be 10% personal, 90% business, but don't claim it. You need to claim what's reasonable. And especially if you're working in a medium where you're not making a ton of money, your, your home expense is kind of the least important thing you have. When you're figuring that kind of expense out, what you're looking at is the running costs of the home. So if you rent, you're going to take your rent, any utilities, your, your, your tenant insurance, and the repairs to your home, you're going to add it all up and take away a portion for personal. Now, I live in a four room condo and I have one room that's dedicated business office. So I take a quarter, even though I work in a lot of other parts of my, my condo because I do my audition self tapes in my living room and I do a lot of my acting work in the living room. I don't bother to claim it. It's not reasonable because I spend most of my time in the living room watching TV, which is kind of a business expense, but I don't touch it because I have an office and my office is really easily defendable. So I get a lot of people who get really caught up in like, well, what's the percentage that's right? And I can't answer that for you because everybody's situation is different and you need to trust your gut, figure out what's reasonable, ask your accountant. And that same percentage idea is going to apply to your cell phone, your internet, what's reasonable for you to use as a business and your transportation costs. So any kind of running costs like your car, if you own your car, um, lease payments, that kind of stuff. It's taking the full value of the running costs and taking a percentage of personal and a percentage of business. And you just want to be prudent when it comes to stuff that has personal value. There's stuff that's going to be 100% business and that's going to be your paint and your art supplies and your inventory if you make t-shirts or your jewelry making supplies. That stuff you should be claiming the full value if you think it's a, if it's all business. But when it comes to the stuff that has personal and business use, you should be more conservative there. And when it comes to food, um, a couple of different ways you can claim food. One is what they call business entertainment, which is I think line four of the expenses there. Business entertainment is the government's word for networking meals. It's real clunky. We don't put things like gallery admissions in there, even though it says entertainment. It's literally that category is designed for food because every time you put that dollar value into your business entertainment category, it's automatically reduced by half. And that half is the 
biological imperative to eat. So when we're writing off food, we can only claim half of the food before going out with the person. So when I have a meal with a person and it's going to could lead me to a line of income, I could write it off potentially. Um, I don't have to buy their food. I can go, we can go Dutch, but I can only claim half of my total business meal total. Um, so the rules of food around that are in town. So in Toronto, for my example, I have to be with somebody to lead to a line of income to claim a business meal. However, if I get sent to Winnipeg for a week to work, I can have a meal alone and write it off as a business expense, still only, only at half, but because I've been sent away from my home, away from my kitchen by more, more than 40 kilometers overnight, I can be alone for a business meal because I don't have access to my kitchen. So in town, I've got to be with somebody out of town, I can be alone. The third place where we can claim food would be things like catering, if we are catering an opening night of an event or of our, of our show or we're, we're making a film and we have craft, that kind of food doesn't have to be deducted by half because we didn't eat half of a catered meal for 800 people. So food has a few different places you can put it. Two of them have to be reduced by half. And one of them, if you are catering an event for a lot of people, you don't have to reduce by half. Um, people get pretty caught up on travel expenses. Travel, just bear in mind that if the travel, the trip is not all business, don't take all of it for business. If it's a portion, if the business trip is trip is half biz, half personal, just claim half. You really don't want your business that you send to the government to say, my business made $2,000. I spent all my money on living at home, eating a lot of food and traveling. You want it to be, spend a lot of money on, on advertising and networking and investing in a good website that kind of stuff. Advertising is a really great expense because it does show intent to earn a profit. Paying a gallery is a great expense. Paying anybody to help you make money is a great expense. Um, creating portfolios, building a website. Those are all great expenses. Paying an accountant to do your taxes is a great expense. Office supplies, subcontractors. There's a lot of expenses. We just don't have a ton of time in this, in this hour and a half to like dig into the nitty gritty. But if you're not sure, you can call the CRA. They're not always gonna give you the best answer when you get to the juniors, but if you get to a senior, you can talk about it in more depth. Um, don't get into the habit of, re of relying on tax broken telephone, which is what I call it when people come into my office and say, my friend said I can write off all my haircuts. And I say, what do you do for a living? And they say, I'm a painter. And I say, you can't write off your haircuts because there's no reason the hair a painter needs to have a haircut. Um, as an actor, I get to write off my haircuts uh, because I have to look like my headshot. But uh, I have a lot of writer clients who think they need to they can write off their haircuts because they're in, still in the film and TV business, but they can't because there's no reason for them to have a good haircut to write a script. So things like haircuts and stuff like and clothing, people always want to write off clothing. Not a great idea to write off stuff that has so much personal use. Um, a lot of actors want to write off their everything that they wear because that's their brand, but the government will say no. They'll just say no if you get audited. So why, why do it? It's not worth it. A uh, quick, quick on incorporation versus self-employed. The a lot of people will ask about whether they should incorporate, or they'll they'll come in and they'll say like, "Well, I got my master business license now. I'm a business." As an individual, we can be a business just by saying, I don't want to be a business. We don't have to get a master business license. We don't have to incorporate. And incorporation can be complicated and expensive. The two most common reasons people will incorporate are they're trying to protect themselves from liability. So the example I have to give is my sister was a personal trainer, which involves potential to hurt somebody you know, personal training can involve some, some some injury and somebody could turn around and sue her and take her house. Um, incorporating means that she's protecting her personal assets and they can only sue the company which is at, whose assets might be like a treadmill and not a house. So you would incorporate to protect yourself from, from liability or you would incorporate because you've made so much money you just can't spend it all. Corporate tax rate is 13.5% for a small business, which is under, under half a million dollars. Um, if you made this amount of money in the sole proprietorship, you'd be paying 50% tax. It's quite different. But the 
pulling money out of the corporation to use personally is taxed at the normal personal tax rate. So if you incorporate it, then you need, you need half the money you incorporate it, you have in the corporation just to pay your mortgage and your spousal support and that kind of stuff. You're not really benefiting from incorporating because whatever comes out of the corporation to be used personally is put taxed personally. So whenever you are thinking incorporation is right for me talk to an accountant it's worth communicating with an accountant who actually looks at your numbers and understands specifically your numbers before you incorporate um corporate corporate tax returns run twenty five hundred dollars and a sole proprietor tax return runs three to four hundred dollars generally um i've seen it run up to about 700 but that seems extreme don't incorporate if you don't have to wait talk to an accountant and get proper education before you do something as significant as that. We're going to talk a little bit about bookkeeping, about HST, we're going to do a quick break, and then we're going to come back and do Q&A. If you have questions, just hold off on the chat until we're into the Q&A. Uh, a lot of people want to know what apps to use. I started out my bookkeeping career using Excel, just because everyone's got it and it's great. It doesn't have to be fancy if you're not incorporated. Excel is a really handy little software. Otherwise, things like QuickBooks and FreshBooks and Zero, Wave, Cashew, those are all great apps. QuickBooks has certainly raised their prices recently, but it is pretty industry standard. Um, FreshBooks, I know a lot of people use because the invoicing function is great. So if you're doing a lot of invoicing, like my therapist uses FreshBooks and I get my little FreshBooks invoice from her every week. Um, again, really, really great. I know that when you pay the monthly fee, you're usually getting with that some tech support. and so. I encourage people to to use the tech support. I've definitely called the QuickBooks online people to ask about X and Y and Z, and they talk you through it. And it's part of the fact that you're paying them. So, not a bad thing if you are going to go the paid route to just make sure you're using their support, so you're setting it up properly, or hire an accountant or bookkeeper to set up your books for you if you're not sure what you're doing. But the most basic form of bookkeeping is just to use Excel or a notebook, keep track of everything that's in and everything that's out. Uh, you don't have to get fancy with your bookkeeping. I will say that keeping your receipts is a question I get asked a lot. You're supposed to keep your receipts for seven years. Another big question I get is about uh, digital receipts. You don't have to print them out. The printer receipts that we get when we get receipts, they will fade over time. And people are always worried about what do you do if it fades and there's I haven't found a great solution to that because they do fade and we have to keep them for seven years and the government wants paper receipts they don't want your credit card statements they they want your box of paper receipts they want your shoe box or your banker's box so if so people some people have gone to the extent of like they get the crappy old receipt and take a photo of it a backup photo of it it seems like a lot of work but if you're really anxious about audits and stuff like that keeping good track of your paperwork is really really important and one of the tricks is just not fold the receipts because when you fold them it degrades the ink in the fold. Uh, I have a storage locker full of years and years of receipts just because I don't I haven't gotten into my shred the shred party time of my life but keep your receipts for seven years keep them carefully. I have on my desktop of my computer you know a, a, a folder for every year for digital receipts and I throw my bank statements and my all my receipts for the year into a folder that I keep there because you just never know. I've definitely been part of an audit for my sister, who's, who I, whose numbers I don't do, but she's my sister. And I remember taking a cab with three big bankers boxes to the CRA and just handing them over, box for the year, big heavy. They want those things. They want your bankers boxes. They will go through them. But bear in mind that audits don't happen as much as people think they do. They really don't. I've been doing this for 14 years and I've seen four, maybe four audits, and one of them was my sister who's not a client in, in any way, like, and and she was audited because the bookkeeper she hired made a really big mistake and didn't catch it, and the CRA software algorithm caught it, and um, had he been a good bookkeeper, it would never have happened, and she would have been fine, but um, algorithms, as far as we can tell, are trained to look for discrepancies, so how she was audited was they looked at three years, one year looked normal. The second year, her advertising expenses went up by $60,000. And then the third year, they went down. So there was an anomaly where one year, her advertising expense was really out of line. And it was because the bookkeeper missed a decimal place. 
you know, the bookkeeper missed a couple of decimal places. He just didn't put a zero, it didn't put a decimal place in at all. So a $60 expense became a $60,000 expense, which as you can imagine was a huge discrepancy and the algorithm caught that and, um, and she got out of it for three years. So keep your expenses consistent, <laughs> the bottom line there, do what you can. Um, HST, everyone always has questions about HST. Most people are afraid of HST. You don't have to be, if you have a decent accountant, they can really take care of a lot of it for you. The biggest things about HST is that if you are going to get an HST number, you cannot spend the HST you collect. The minute you spend it, the minute you dig a hole for yourself, HST is not your money. So when you have an HST number, the money you're collecting for HST should be living in a secondary account. You just put it away and don't think about it and save it for the government. They consider it a crown debt, a debt to the crown. If you don't pay it, they don't have any forgiveness because it was never your money. So you get an HST number the minute you get close to earning $30,000 from freelance activities. And that doesn't include grants because grants are exempt from HST because HST is, is a goods and services tax and grants do not provide a good or a service. They provide creation. So grants are exempt. So if all of your income is grants, you might not need to get an HST number, but if your income, your gross business income is over 30 consistently because of grants, you might consider getting an HST number regardless because one, the CRA HST department will do random scans of tax returns and look for large gross freelance businesses and say, well, where's their HST number? And then just give you an HST number without your expectation. Um, and also when you have an HST number, the money you spend in running your business on HST, you get to keep. So what that means is, the top example, this top cube is the standard HST. You collect HST and you send it to Ottawa, you spend HST, you get it back from Ottawa. So if my total income was $30,000 and I collected $3,900 of HST, the HST that I spend running my business. So I buy pens for my business and they cost a dollar plus tax. So 13 cents of this pen cost is HST. I get to keep the HST on that. I get to keep 13 cents. So I give the government my $3,900, $3,900 minus the 13 cents in HST on this pen and any other HST that I'm spending on a portion of my cell phone bill, a portion of my gas bill, a portion of, of uh, my, my house utilities, and then any HST I'm spending on my art supplies and my, my guitar strings and whatever expenses I have, there's HST spent, you get to keep that. You don't have an HST number, you don't keep the HST, you just write it off as part of your taxes. But when you have an HST number, the HST you spend gets separated out and you get to keep it. So it's a nice little gift there. Quick method HST just means that if you don't have a ton of expenses, you can give the government an assumed percent, which is 8.8% of your gross income plus HST. If you don't have a ton of expenses, it tends to be that you'll come out ahead with quick method, but this is a conversation to have with an accountant who knows your numbers. When you register for HST, you're gonna automatically be put on the regular or long method, which is the first example, which is where I collect, I give, I spend, I keep. You're gonna stick with that one unless otherwise specified with your accountant. Um, and getting an HST number, just to re reiterate, it's easy to do it by phone. People who do it online, I find that when they do it online on the website, don't seem to, it doesn't seem to stick. Like they can, they, they get told they have an HST number, but then they don't actually have one. So doing it by phone is pretty quick and easy uh, because the CRA loves giving HST numbers out because it just means they get more tax. So they will give out the HST number quickly and easily calling them. Um, now this presentation is gonna be available on YouTube to go back and look at this. And also I'm gonna send the slides to Gabe who will also make those available. So if you needed the phone number or any more information, you're gonna have access to this information again. We're gonna take the quickest five minute break and then we're gonna do a Q and A. So pop your questions into the chat now. And in five minutes, we will do, uh, we'll fire away with some questions. So stretch your legs, go to the bathroom and I'll see you back here at 8.10. Thanks, Tova. Um, we'll see you in 10 minutes, folks. Five minutes at 8.10. Yeah, sorry, five minutes at 8.10.
Abe, I think we need to get some elevator type music to play <laughs> when we're on breaks. Well, Are you gonna, ready for questions, Tova? Well, we're going to give people one more minute, I think, just in case there's still people. Okay, one more minute. And I um, think there are some questions in the chat. Yeah, yeah. I had, had a look here just to see what was going on. Um, so I, I am I will I will just read through the questions. I think if everybody has access to the chat, they can see the questions too. So I don't have to read the questions. But all right, it's eight ten. So I'm going to start with question one, which is from Sean about a the limit to how much expenses you should deduct so your income isn't too low. The situation that happened with CERB and the $5,000, it's unlikely that's going to happen again. I mean, knock on wood, that situation was pretty complicated. And the information that came out changed <laughs> the CRA on a daily basis. We were all pretty flummoxed about how to deal with that. Um, the the There's no right or wrong way to know how much your net income should be. Other than that, we want to focus on not having not running losses for more than three consecutive years. Um, a lot of people will get caught up in in trying to make as little money as possible. But there's actually there's credits that are available for people that are working for which is the, the Canada Worker Benefit, which is about $1,200. Um, it's a nice credit. And if you're if you're gross taxable income, your taxable income is in the $12,000 range, you're actually standing to get more money back in a refund than you would if your taxable income was $5,000. So um, all that to say, your income is your income and how it and how it lies is how it lies. Um, I think that maybe Sean tried to write off the entire cost of a computer, which you can't do. You can't write off the entire cost of a per computer purchase because computers are assets and they have long-term value and they have to be depreciated. Mm -hmm. um, so that means there's some fancy accounting there where the cost of any kind of an asset purchase, a computer or a cell phone, things that cost 500 to $1,000 or more individually, they're not a write-off in one go. They have to be written off based on the depreciation class that they're in computers are fifth class 55 and cars are class 10 and I mean there's a lot of it's where you want to get into an accountant if you're trying to write things off but don't just know that you can't write off the cost of a computer buying a computer you have to write it off at the depreciable value of the computer per year so that's sort of a sideline for Sean there anybody else who's trying to buy a computer a computer is not a write off in one go there's there's math involved there which is sort of more complicated than we want to get into here um, but basically your bottom line with your net income should be what feels legitimate <laughs> I mean that's the bottom line is that your taxes have to be legitimate if you didn't make any money you didn't make any money um, and I hope we're never dealing with the CERB thing again we have no way of knowing that that's going to happen but um, if your business doesn't make a ton of money, that's just the truth of the matter. We just want to keep from having business losses. So if you're concerned about your income looking weird, that's where you're going to go back to your expenses and go, well, did I claim too much of my house? Did I claim too many meals? Did I claim too much of my car? Scale those back. You know, make sure you're being careful about how you claim your expenses so that they, your business still looks like a proper business. Um, so Hetty has asked a question about receiving a grant. I um, think Sean's got his hand up. Uh, okay. the yeah. On the question. Just while we're dealing with Sean, I think we might want to. Does Sean want to turn his mic on and ask the question? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to clarify um, that I was, um, let me turn my video on. Um, I just wanted to clarify that um, I, I didn't, um, write it up. All I meant to say was um, I, I wasn't including it as an expense. I, it, it wasn't that I was, I, I didn't, I claimed it, I just left it as a personal item. So I didn't, but normally I do, whenever I buy a machine, I do deduct, deduct it like at the proper rate each year. So uh, I just wanted to clarify that, like you, you kind of implied that I um, tried to write off the whole machine at the same time, but um, I didn't, uh, 
Yeah, I just wanted to clarify. I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> I was never going to rat you out to the CRA. What you do isn't my business. I just no, no, no. <laughs> for everybody to know that you can't. You're because your question says I wrote off a computer. I'm going to make sure everyone knows. Everyone knows you can't write off a computer at the whole value. But Sean, you're fine. I wouldn't worry about it. Thanks. All right. So what else have we got? Uh, Hetty was asking a question about getting a grant, which is amazing. Um, uh, Hetty, if you want to be claiming expenses against the grant, you're going to have to write a run a small sort of a small business to 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 declare the expenses. Um, you don't. You should not incorporate if it's if it's just a grant that you're getting personally. Uh, as I said, incorporation is expensive and complicated. But if you want to be writing off the grant expenses there's a, it's sort of the easy thing to do is to run a business but that's a question that's probably going to be better addressed by talking to an accountant about your situation because your situation is more complicated than than this scenario um you can claim the grant and not claim expenses and there are ways to do that but it's a it's just a longer conversation there's a lot of options available to you because grants have a lot of vagaries and trickery and it's tricky. So I would encourage you to sit down with an accountant and and with, with more detail, how much the grant was, what's the plan for the grant, that kind of stuff and make a plan that way. Um, you're looking for recommendations for a court for, for a small artist film company. Don't I don't have a particular uh, recommendation for a corporate accountant for a film company. Um, I would suggest you just pop it on Facebook because everyone has an opinion about accountants on Facebook, apparently. Um, you should be able to find one. It, 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 certainly in town for film for film companies. Um, yeah, it's not a it's a pretty specialized business, the film, especially with tax credits and stuff like that. And I don't have a good recommendation. The only company that I know people who use, I don't recommend them. I don't think they do a good job. So I don't have a recommendation, unfortunately. Oh, one so, more question. Tova, can I just say something there? Hetty, you might want to check with some of the professional associations that like the Directors Guild of Canada or ACTRA or Equity. Um, they may be able to recommend a company. Um, I would after my equity wouldn't know much much about film film stuff. Um, but, sorry, that's okay. But you know what I mean. Those kinds of uh, professional associations related to filmmaking. I would say those are both actor organizations. They're not going to necessarily know about filmmaking, but um, you might go to Lift Liaison Event Independent mm -hmm. Film. film. T, what does the T stand for? Lift and Wiz on of Independent Filmmakers of Toronto. There you go. Lift would probably have a good recommendation. They might send you to us because we usually do some, do workshops with them, but we don't do corporate tax in our books. Um, but I, again, Facebook. I don't know. Just there's a lot of people will talk about their accounts. People have strong opinions about accountants. <laughs> they just do. Maybe you love them or you hate them. Um, Eddie's last question about listing your expenses. It's gonna, I'm gonna loop back to, I, I think you need to speak to an accountant. Um, there is a place to be putting your expenses for your for your grant. And that's part of that income statement that we talked about at the beginning of the of the meeting. Um, typically when people do their taxes themselves to your TurboTax or your or you file, those softwares aren't great for artists who are not versed in tax and it's no one's fault it's just the way that those things are designed they're not designed to be as friendly to freelance artists as they are to people who know more, more about business so there are places where you can put expenses but they're often the wrong place i just see people coming in with their tax returns that they've done themselves and i'm like wow this is a hodgepodge um, but because I don't know your numbers, Hetty, I don't want to give you the wrong advice. I would just say you probably need to sit down with an accountant and just get a good sense of it. Um, seeing an accountant as a tax write-off, which is not a bad thing. There are a lot of ways to deal with grants on tax returns. They just there just is. It's it's not straightforward, and a, every accountant's going to have their own view of it. Let me just see if I can pull up this tax folio. See. Um, I 
goodness me. The, Hedy, I would encourage you to do a little um, research. You can call the CRA um, research grants. This is not what I want. No. Okay. I just look. I'm going to just pop this part into. So I know I'm reading, I'm reading um, Google here for you. I'm gonna pop this in. This is a CRA's pretty simplistic way of dealing with, with artist project grants. That's a link to it. And you can have a look there. Um, there are other ways of handling the artist project grant, which I think are more sophisticated and a, and a bit more, um, they make your business look legitimate. And the CRA's simplistic version sort of doesn't give artists legitimacy that I think that they deserve. But the link that I sent Hetty is um, a way of doing a grant that shouldn't raise flags. And it's from the government's, it's from the horse's mouth. So you can have a look there. Um, any other questions? Uh, Sean, I file using an online tax service. There used to be a way to contribute to CPP in the last couple years. I haven't been able to find a way to contribute. Okay, so yeah, so um, the only way to contribute to CPP is to make enough money to contribute to CPP. So if your taxable income is too low, you, you won't contribute to CPP. Your CPP is calculated based on your income. And so if your income is low, there's just no, you're not putting money in. You're not, it's based on your income. So if your income is low, there's no CPP going in. It's a really good question, Sean, because you, you want to be maximizing your CPP contributions. But because it's based on income, if we have low income years, we're not putting any money in. Your next step is to put money into an RRSP or TFSA to, to back up the loss of CPP income. A lot of people don't realize this. When we pay tax, our tax bill is usually made up of federal, provincial tax, and CPP. Um, when you're freelance, you're responsible for all of the CPP that the employer would pay a portion of if you were an employee. So when I have a day job, my employee pays half my CPP. And when I'm a freelancer, I have to pay the full, the full amount, which is over $6,000 um, max these days. So when you're filing your taxes as a freelancer, if your net income is low, you're not going to be putting any money into CPP. And a lot of people will kind of go for a, a lower tax rate lower tax bill now to, to avoid paying taxes now, but what they're doing is they're also negating putting any money into CPP and CPP is indexed to inflation. It's something you wanna be putting money into. So when people are like, oh my God, my tax bill is so horrible. Half your tax bill is probably CPP and that's might feel horrible now, but when you retire and you have the max CPP, it's gonna be great. A lot of artists don't maximize your CPP contributions through their lifetime because they just don't make any money. And then they really don't, they're kind of screwed with, with the CPP. So don't be afraid of your tax bill because so much of it is gonna be CPP. And, and if you don't put any money in now, you don't get any when you retire and it, it's, it's, it's challenging. So, pay your taxes because a lot of it's going to be CPP. And if you don't have enough money, if you're not making enough to contribute to CPP and you have the money, put it into an RRSP or a TFSA immediately. I'm just going to yell at my cat. Don't do that. Hey, don't do that. Sorry. Got to yell at the cat every once in a while. Hey, stop. Sweetie. There we go. The clap always works. Um, any other questions here? Um, I think that might be all the questions. We've got a few more. I, ha I have a question I just wanted to read that um, there's a, an artist who wanted to come who's disabled and fell and hurt herself today. Sure. She just emailed it to me. Um, how is art income generated from the sales of art regarded when the artist is on ODSP? Is it similar to how grants are treated when on ODSP? This is the second workshop I've done this year and the second time I've had a question about ODSP where I've realized that I'm not educated in ODSP, unfortunately. Um, my tax practice is really just, you know, on a case by case basis and I haven't had a client on ODSP, so I don't know a ton about ODSP and how it's handled. I have a friend on ODSP who I help out and we claim her artist income the same way we would claim anybody else's. I know that there's some kind of... Um, well, I learned last week at the last workshop I gave that there is a different 
treatment of grants for people with ODSP, but mm -hmm. I don't want to, I don't want to give information that I, I don't want to talk out of my ass. I don't know the answer. Okay. Um, in general, the one friend whose taxes I do, who has ODSP, her, her art practice has always just been handled the same way anybody else's has been because it's income. It's just, it's, it's, you know, if, if her tax practice is, or her art practices, uh, she's a musician and she's playing gigs. And that's just, it's, I mean, that's to me is taxable income. It could be that I'm wrong. Um, it's never been an issue. And we've, okay. so, so I don't know the answer to that. And I would rather um, your friend go straight to ODSP and talk to them because they make the rules and not get the information from someone like me who would just wouldn't be able to give the right information. Okay, thank you. Yeah, of course. Any other questions out there? I think not. I think we might all be wrapped up because it's a crappy night out. Let me just go mm -hmm. and have a hot chocolate and go to bed. Um, Gabe wants everyone to fill out the evaluation survey. You better do that or Gabe will come after you. He looks, his cat is, his cat is very tough. That's very right. good. <laughs> An aggressive cat who knows how to climb. So fill in your evaluation forms. And um, I just want to thank everybody for coming. I know tax can be uh, dull and a pain in the butt and nobody likes to do it or talk about it, but I really um, think it's great when people are taking the proactive step of learning a bit about tax and learning about the government because um, it's so easy to be scared and hide. And I, I commend you all for being here on a, on a crappy Thursday night to talk about it. It's, it's, it does, it will do you good whether you know it or not. <laughs> so thank you all for coming. And thank you to EC3 for having me. It was a real pleasure. Toby, you were just great. Thank you so much. And it's, um, it's a really huge asset to have this recording and your slide deck available to artists in our community. I think we'll, we'll follow up with a little bit of research maybe with, um, with Lyft and maybe with Tangled. Um, uh, yeah, Tangled would have some information too. Tangled would have some stuff on ODSP, I think. Um, and um, one thing we've sometimes done when people have asked us to recommend an art friendly um, or knowledgeable accountant in Peterborough um, is to get them to call arts organizations that they know or work with in Peterborough and ask who does the organization's audit because at least the people might have a broad landscape picture. Um, there is um, a, a company in Peterborough and a person in Peterborough who, who um, specializes in dealing with Revenue Canada collections. Um, Frank Flynn does that, but um, I think they're the only ones who do that. So I'm not shy to say their name, but uh, outside of that, we can't really recommend specific companies. People have to do a bit of research and find a company that they think would fit their, their needs. But I think you've given everybody a really good head start. Um, I think maybe one of the toughest um, leaps is that uh, self-employed income and particularly in the arts is complex and maybe bite the bullet and get your get an accountant work with an accountant and um, I always encourage people even if they see an accountant for just one year and learn from them and then teach themselves from that it's such an important investment and when I work with the new client and show them the effect that their bookkeeping has on their numbers they get really empowered um, not all accounts are going to sit down and talk you through all your stuff like someone like art books will do, but ha having somebody on your side as on, on your team, team art is, is, is huge. Um, and why not be that, why not that, let that person be the person who's helping you with your money, you know, just to, it, it, it it's, um, it's your money. Don't give it to the government if you don't have to. Give well, them thanks, thanks to you. Thanks to art books. And, um, you can uh, get their con contact information easily online. And Gabe, thanks for all your work on this. And thanks to all of you for coming. Good luck with your income tax. It always makes everybody. me lose half my hair every year. Yeah. Um, you and everybody else. Yep. Thanks for having and what's us. What's the name of the show where we can see you soon? Oh, Thank there's you. a new show called Spencer Sisters, which is gonna, which is gonna air um, 
in a couple of weeks and I'll be in episode five playing uh, uh, an angry woman with uh, with mother issues. Oh, and is that streaming or on a uh, network television? On CTV. On CTV. Okay, the Spencer Sisters with Tova. With me and and Leah Thompson from Back to the Future. Very good. Thanks again to you and everybody else. Take care. Bye. Good Good night. Good night.